What is it that we need that we don't yet have? Exploration of Mars will not reform the corruption of our non-elected rulers, just as creating a multi-billion dollar atom-smashing cyclotron will not help protect children from predatory pedophile priests. What, what is humanity as a whole symbolized mostly with, you know, herds of sheep. And, and, but this is systematic, this is systematic. And the biggest thing is fear. What keeps the sheep in line? I mean, look at it for the sheep analogy. You've got a shepherd and a sheepdog and hundreds of sheep. And yet a shepherd and a sheepdog can get hundreds of sheep to go where they want. Now, the sheepdog is symbolic of fear. The shepherd is symbolic of the authority that uses fear to keep the herd in line. That's precisely what happens to keep humanity in line. Because we are being controlled. We are being pointed in a particular direction. We are being told to watch this, to be this, to look this certain way, to ingest this pill when we feel this way. You know, we, we are being told to live a very specific life. And a very, there is a very specific mold that you are told you know, at least by at, at least by the general public, you know, how a person is raised by their family is different. But today's society teaches you that you have to go to school, go to college, get a job, get married, settle down. There you go. And while you're doing all that, watch some TV and buy some cool stuff. Can we call ourselves intelligent beings if we overindulge ourselves into extinction? How much is too much? That should be the question. They take a, a fourth or actually a third of your yearly salary for themselves. And they're the ones that have built these corporations that have destroyed the planet and taken things, uh, uh, sustainable systems away from us like biofuels, hemp for fuel, uh, sustainable en energy sources of all sorts. They've killed the electric car. Uh, they're the ones that sell us these religions that keep them in power because when you believe in an almighty and the slave is supposed to do good by his master, right? Then you you fall in line and you maintain going back to the status quo. As human beings, we have to compare our tremendous similarities to our trivial differences. When doing so, we see that all we need is fresh air, clean water, organic food, and a chance to work our way towards a better life. However, it's come to be obvious that there's no more mobility in our social stratification, and the result of our petrification of liberty is that we are, as parents of this planet, failing in our responsibilities, not only to ourselves, but to future generations. The difference between a slave and a prisoner is that the prisoner knows that there's freedom just on the other side of the wall and that getting the freedom is a finite set of steps. The slave doesn't understand that there's freedom out there. The slave thinks this is all there is, there's nothing I can do about it, and all I can ever hope for is kind of a better master. Someone who's just, you know, I'm still a slave, I'm completely dependent, they will provide me with what I need and tell me what I need to do, I just hope that maybe they, they have a better protocol, right? So the slave mentality is waiting for well, a better protocol to tell them what to do. And the prisoner mentality is free thinking and trying to figure out, I'm in a box, they've put me in this, in this confined area, how do I break out of here? How do I get over this proverbial wall? The idea is that through sharing information and communicating through a fact-based reliable media that has it's verifiable and has integrity that you can offer people this rope that allows them to climb over the wall it's like we're just we're not trying to break everybody out but we're just saying if you understand that there is freedom out there and you are looking for the rope to climb over the wall don't look at it as a threat when we're throwing the rope over the wall and trying to say hey look here's a little information so here's a critical thinking question if the status quo is in direct conflict with our needs as human beings to survive, then in whose interest is the status quo created? And who's benefiting from all this destruction? N. 
W O. An ideology of the use of force and suppression to control a minimal, subservient population, marked by a draw to psychopathy and as represented by the captains of corporate ships. We economic hitmen have managed to create the world's first truly global empire, and it's basically a secret empire. We do it many ways, but, but, but principally, uh, we identify a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, range a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters. The money never actually goes to the country. It goes to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country that help a few very wealthy people but don't benefit the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity or have cars to drive on the highways, and yet they're left holding a huge debt that they can't repay. So we go back at some point and say, you know, you can't pay your debts. Give us a pound of flesh. Sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Vote with us on the next critical UN vote. Allow us to build a military base in your backyard. Something along these lines. And when we fail, the jackals go in and either overthrow or assassinate these leaders. And if the jackals fail, as they did in, in, in Iraq, then we send in the military. I don't think the failure is capitalism. I think it's a specific kind of capitalism that we've developed. We've created what I consider a mutant viral form of capitalism. And this mutant form of capitalism, which I think is really a predatory form of capitalism, has created an extremely unstable, unsustainable, unjust, and, and very, very dangerous world. Uh, I've met a lot of terrorists. I've interviewed them for books. I've never met one who wanted to be a terrorist. They're desperate people. If we want to get rid of terrorism, we must get rid of the root causes, that cancer that is destroying uh, our whole system. Because I think it's really important that we understand today we cannot have homeland security unless we understand that the whole planet is our homeland. If you think back to our education, I don't remember being taught anything about a new world order. Um, I think that the famous quote by George H.W. Bush on September 11th, 1991. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be. We have a real chance at this new world order. And the, uh, the subsequent quote by, it was Gary Hart, mm -hmm. who had also talked about the new world order, I guess brought it into the public conscience. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think, only once, and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. Despite the massive evidence, the idea of a loosely organized group of ruling elites whose common desired agenda is a new world order of master slavery with the elites in direct control of humanity is still hotly debated. Although, with every passing year, additional proof is revealed exposing the existence of groups with such a set of ideals. The idea of the few controlling the many through mental rather than physical means, however, is not a new one. The idea of the New World Order has been around since, let's say, Plato's time. So that's 400 BC. So this isn't a new idea. It's an idea that has existed since, uh, since somebody got more information than somebody else and they sought to use it against somebody else. So it's not a new dynamic. The philosophy of the New World Order is, as far as we can trace it back presently, we can trace it back to Plato and Plato's Republic and Plato's laws. It was looking into 
books from the past and seeing that this is not a new idea, that this idea started with Plato's Republic. I have several different versions of Plato's Republic by various authors and whatnot, but the point would be they're kind of hard to understand. It's, it's heavy language. Plato basically was attempting to set up the perfect society where everything was controlled down to reproduction and art and everything else so that the elites could always maintain control. It's the use of the intellect to subvert other people's conscience. And so when you look at all of these things, these are all like leaves on a tree because the, the tree's root and the tree's core, the tree's trunk, if you will, has to do with the suppression of consciousness. And so when you're talking about the idea of a new world order, this is the idea of suppression of consciousness, just not of a small group, but the idea of doing it around the world. It's a comprehensive endeavor where uh, a certain group of people, a certain strata of the intellectual elite, seek to subjugate those masses who were denied a, uh, a proper education. Plato's philosophies actually bled out into Neoplatonism, which became the Dark Ages of Europe. And most of modern philosophy and technology originates from China and India, as people like Buckminster Fuller showed in his book, The Critical Path. So I think it's, it's a utopian agenda that's designed for a utopia for the elites. And then what they do is they use spin or they use false rhetoric to sell it to the masses as their utopia also. When you look at the history of these ideas and you see them bubbling up through Plato's Republic and you might, you might say, well that's 2,500 years ago. What about today? Well, in the last century, you had a book by H.G. Wells called The New World Order. And so these ideas, which are old and ancient ideas, have been brought up today, and certain people in the last century have coveted these ideas and, and taken less than public roots of getting these ideas into everybody's consciousness, even if it's um, subliminally or, you know, as an aside, out of context, like George H.W. Bush's comments in 1991. That wasn't the point of the speech, that's just one little line in the speech, but it has resonance today because when you look at the history and how it's repeated, and how it's repeated through the works of H.G. Wells and other Fabian socialists and other theosophists of the early 20th century, it's obvious that these ideas were coveted for reasons. The reasons are that they give people power and that people who use greed to attain power are, are inclined to practice these ideas, to keep them alive, to formulate countries based on these ideas, such as America was formed. The philosophy of the ruling elites is an evolving one, with its roots in the ideas of some of our greatest thinkers. Plato's Republic is mandatory reading when being reared for elite education, as are the ideas of Quintus Fabius Maximus, which are the root of the Fabian Society, an international group of think tanks whose chief aims are to promote socialism through gradual rather than revolutionary means. So insofar as the New World Order, it's always been an idea through time where people who worship themselves and worship their ego take it upon themselves to say, here's how we should run the world, and it doesn't matter about the little people who don't know about this because they're not smart enough to care and they need to be told what to do. And that's exactly what Plato tells you in the Republic when he's, when he's designing this utopia. It's all about the intellectual elite. It's not education for everybody. It's specialized roles. It tells you when you can and can't have sex. It tells you how to have babies in a society after having sex on these four ritual dates a year. So Plato's Republic is a deep, deep masterpiece of literature but how it applies to everyday man is not necessarily directly taught in our education system because if in teaching it, you would understand the structure that you're kind of controlled by and thereby you would, you would find the way out.